Welcome, Pam. I'm so excited to have you on. My whole team has been totally cognizant of the fact that I have been dying to get the workers, uh, Justice for Workers on here, the Workers Action Center, to talk about them. I, I've talked about them in many of my episodes. I draw a lot of inspiration from you and your team. Can you introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, I'm happy to. And thanks so much for having me. Uh, so my name is Pam Frake. I'm uh, the coordinator of the Justice for Workers campaign, formerly the Fight for 15 and Fairness. Um, and I'm, I'm also a, an organizer with the Workers Action Center. And for some time, I've been a trade union activist, social justice activist, and a rabble rouser of all sorts. So I'm really happy to be here today. I see you slapped on your justice uh, for workers sticker. I know I showed off on my fight for 15 shirt that I, I earned over here because I did uh, have the benefit of working with you guys for a, a little bit. And it was very exciting time for me, but you have, you mentioned you've since rebranded. So a lot of folks will have remembered that campaign, the fight for 15. It was previously 14 clearly you can't rebrand every few years as inflation goes up. So now you are justice for workers. And that's more than a livable wage, is it not? Um, so well, what we did, there's 10 demands still for the campaign. So we've been calling for a $20 minimum wage and uh, 10 paid sick days. And there's a whole list that I can go through with everyone. I think the thing that, uh, to remember for us when we're bringing forward demands is that we talk to workers in precarious employment to find out from them what they want to fight for. Like, because it's not just having a, like a number, it's about, it's also a subjective factor for workers about what they think is winnable at any given moment. And it's really interesting because even back for the 14 Now campaign, when we launched that in within 18 months, we were able to get a bump in the minimum wage. People may recall at that time, the minimum wage had been frozen for four years at 1025. And then as uh, in response to the 14 Now campaign, the provincial government moved Moved to increase it to eleven dollars an hour, and that's also when we when we won the annual cost of living adjustments. And what's interesting about that moment is that after that happened, we went back to talk to workers to say, "Okay, what do you think? Should we be giving up the fight now? We didn't get fourteen; we got eleven. Should we fight? Keep fighting? Should we refresh the demand? What do you think?" And at that moment in time, it was also when south of the border, the fight for 15 had just launched. We launched fight for 14, unbeknownst to us, around the same time as the American, you know, fight for 15. Did they launched. outflank you? They didn't. <laughs> well, they they got their first victory, which is really interesting Good. because we we got our little bump from 10:25 to 11. But then there was the victory that happened in Seattle, actually SeaTac, that suburb of Seattle, where they were able to. In, in the US, um, there there are municipal referendum, like what they call ordinances that people can vote on. It's a bit different. Municipalities can't set laws that govern all the workplaces within a municipality. That's done by the provincial and federal governments. But in the US, they're able to do that. And so they just won this, this bump to 15. So when we went back to workers to say, you know, what do you think? What should we be doing next? And they were like, hell, hell we're not going to stop. And if, and if they can win 15 in the US, we can win 15 here. And you can see that that subjective factor really is about what happens when you get your solidarity on. Because, you know, if you think about what it's like to build a house, if you're just one person, you might decide to build a very small house because you only have yourself to rely on. But if you get more people active, more people involved, then it's possible for people to feel like more becomes possible. And I think that's what we learned with, uh, you know, with the with the Justice for Workers campaign, that we did actually win the path for, you know, uh, the path to a $15 minimum wage. Sadly, we had a provincial government that canceled it. Uh, and froze the cost of living adjustments for two years. And in the in in the context of that experience, going back to talk to workers about what they would find both exciting enough to readjust their lives, to fight for it, because that's a tall order to, for people to commit when you're, especially when you're in precarious employment, it's it's not easy to be politically active. So it has to be exciting enough to fight for, but 
something that people feel is winnable because nobody wants to win their waste their time and so that's kind of the sweet spot and if you want workers themselves to be driving the campaign we take our lead from workers and so after literally hundreds of conversations and small group discussions and you know with people right across the province and so forth people landed on 20 as a as a goal that is maybe not going to be immediately achievable, but is something that is is worth fighting for uh, and so forth. And my coworker Denise is just coming in. <laughs> Welcome, Denise. So I anyway, wanna... that's how we landed on that demand. Yeah. Let me ask you about that because I I was right. going to inquire about some of the other demands that you make as a movement because a lot of the time the focus is on the minimum wage, but if and we will link our audience to your demands and your website so they can kind of read them in full. But sometimes they're the less glamorous things. So I know you talk about that sweet spot of making it exciting, but I guess like you also have to roll in some of the more practical demands that you get from actually talking to workers that yes, they need a more livable wage, but they need worker protections. And Ford not only rolled back the minimum wage and, and all of the other victories, more well-known victories. There was a lot of uh, worker safety protection stripped, training protection stripped, classification changes, things that, you know, don't really pick up in the media and maybe aren't exciting enough to mobilize a lot of workers because they don't affect, you know, as much as the minimum wage does. How do you as a collective make the decision on these other kind of niche demands or, you know, less glamorous demands uh, and make sure that we also get those, that, that justice for workers just isn't more money an hour, right? Like there's just so much more to it. Well, that's an excellent question. And the interesting thing is, is that it's almost like as soon as you pull on the thread of, exa it's exactly what you say, as soon as you pull on the thread of, you know, a, a higher minimum wage, then of course the next question comes. It's like, well, what, but what about me? I only I'm only working 20 hours a week, and I even with that I wouldn't be able to get by. And so it's so it's almost impossible to talk about one thing in isolation from another. So that's the, the and in fact it's what it, for me was so in, instructive. What I learned from the 14 Now campaign is that beside, precisely because of that when the government was responding because you pull on that and all these other issues just exploded, that's when the, the government came back at us and said, okay, we're gonna do this thing on the minimum wage, but here's what we'll do for all the other issues. We're gonna have the changing workplaces review and we're gonna, we're gonna review all the labor laws. So the Ontario Labor Relations uh, Act as well as the Employment Standards Act. And what was interesting about that is that, you know, Basically, that's the whole gamut of everything that structures work in in our province. And so that's when we really developed a big, as big a broad a vision as we possibly could to take that to this government. And we organized community, you know, hearings and so forth and pulling people in. But um, so that's that's a bit of a rambling answer to also say part of the beauty of having broad, you know, slightly broader set of demands is that different workers feel differently about different things. So for example, at the Workers Action Center, wage theft is a massive issue right now. So many workers are coming through without getting their proper pay uh, and so forth. And so there's all sorts of like one-off and or not one-off, but systemic targeted local campaigns of bad bosses who have not been paying wages and so forth and getting people's back pay and all of those kinds of things. So it's almost like there's little like almost like a computer program, there's there's little mini sub programs that are kind of moving all the time. And so, you know, if you lead with the twenty dollar minimum wage, maybe that's not the key issue. Maybe it turns out paid sick days. And actually, in the lead up to the last election, or sorry, not the um, not the most recent one, but in twenty eighteen, I, I, the thing that surprised me is that I thought that the at the time it was like defend our fifteen dollar minimum wage. You know, you know. You know, make sure that we protect it because we just have gotten the new laws and so forth, but also our paid sick days because we we got two tiny little baby paid sick days out of the previous uh, liberal government when obviously more far more were needed. But it was when we were talking about paid sick days that we went, you know, on the streets and in outside workplaces that we got most like 
more people stopped to talk about the paid sick days than the minimum wage. And for me, that was a surprise. And I even learned, for example, that not all unions have paid sick days. It, for me, that was a big shocker because I think I just assumed that the basic package that would be bargained for workers when they join a union would be, you know, better wages, health and safety and paid sick days. Right. But it turns out that that's not always the case, more so for private or sorry, public sector unions than for private sector unions. And so a lot of people were stopping to talk about the paid sick days. And so it's just an interesting thing. And recently we've been really campaigning hard on status for all partly because there's this incredible window where the federal government has promised a regularization program the you know the the you know possibly the the one of the best programs that we could imagine in generation but what's you know what's exciting about that is how many people really resonated with that when when you sort of assume it'll be the twenty dollar minimum wage but certainly when I've been out um, doing outreaches and we lead on the on status for all, I think the first couple of times I did it, I was nervous about what the response was going to be because you, if you listen to the mainstream news, you'd think that it was just going to be all backlash. Like xenophobia, right? Because you're talking about it. migrant workers. Exactly, exactly. But it's it's the exact opposite. Like when you get out to actually talk to ordinary people, like I can't believe how much support there is. Like. You know, we all did. I think we all had the same instinct. It's like, okay, this we're going to do an outreach for justice for workers. And we're going to lead on status for all. And we're going to read up, and we're going to be no more stuff, and we're going to be all ready to go on this. And it was like pushing on an open door where we're just like poof, and you people fall flocked in. to sign up. Yeah, people flocked to sign up. I think in my like in a whole ninety minutes of outreach at one station, there was one person who was a bit of a crank, and that was it. But other people. <laughs> There's even one person who was rushing to get That's the, a really good ratio, you know. I've petitioned on I, a lot of things. <laughs> I know. It was wild. Totally wild. This one person, I remember getting, they were getting off the bus and they kind of took a leaflet, you know, politely. And then and then came running back and were, was pointing to the demand. And I was like, uh-oh, this is where we're, someone's going to let us have it right now. They're pointing to this demand, running back to say something about it. And when they arrived, she said, this is such an important demand. Thank you. Thank you. This is so important. And it was just like, I can't even tell you. So the, if you just listen to the mainstream news, you'd get a, you'd get a totally different conception of where public opinion is at. But most of the time, people want decency and dignity for each other. And that's people's general gut reaction. It's I mean, it's not rhetoric, honestly. <laughs> I remember when you were introducing the Migrant Rights Network, and I'm not sure if that's what it was called at the time, but it was seemed like it was just starting up and you were explaining it to the people showing up at the monthly meeting at the offices where you are now. And it was a profound moment for me because you explained the reasoning behind targeting such issues and that was to go head on into a space where you knew even the progressives the leftists the working class needed help in right it wasn't just to combat what the media shows us right that outward racism that definitely exists and and does kind of lead people to perhaps not fight for migrant rights right to to cordon that off to make a movement more appealing right out of that worry that unfounded worry because of the you know response that you ended up with on the street but i thought that made you folks stand out in my mind because i was really used to partisan political spaces where decisions are very calculated on popularity perceived popularity and anything that might rock the boat is definitely left to the side but that was an opposite approach so that was so admirable for me to see that a lot of ways that you folks organize i have learned so much from it's like and i such a short period of time honestly uh, the consistency of your meetings we've talked about that on the show before but you know folks know that they can always check in with you if they miss a month three four months there's that check-in um and I love that. I don't know if you want to develop on that a little bit more because you sort of talked about how your whole bunch of little subcommittees or, you know, little moving parts in a big moving part. And the best reminder of that for me was 
those meetings. For a while, they were call-ins, but sometimes they're in person and everyone goes around and shares what they're doing. And it's really eclectic, you know, like there's environmentalists, there's labor rights, there's really kind of neighborhood local actions. And um, it's kind of like inspired the format of our show where you were inspired by the actions of others. You got ideas from what they were doing, what was working, what was not working, what messaging you could use, who needed solidarity in that moment. Um, critical issues could be brought to light really quickly. And that, yeah, that, that really kind of, I've tried to mimic that in my work. So what else do you folks do that you could kind of share with our audience that that gives off that vibe that you guys like it was really empowering really encouraging environment as a budding organizer to enter into so like you take that to heart eh? that is a mission of yours i'm sure well totally and i and i mean uh, i guess i might say that i was inspired and and i think so much of the work of the workers action center generally speaking has been inspired um by you know traditions that 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 really value and put workers themselves at the heart of everything we do. But the Domestic Workers Alliance in the US, um, I heard a presentation by them and they had this beautiful frame that I feel like it just struck me and it's just like, that's it exactly. So they had this beautiful frame of three three points. One is um, be the water. And when you think about water, what is it about water? Water is completely persistent. If there's a log jam, it goes over it. It goes under it. It goes into the cracks. Even if it can't get through, it keeps, you know, it keeps at it and it wears away the mightiest cliffs of stone. It works its way into every crack and crevice. It's like, we are going to be relentless. So we want a movement that is relentless and it's not going to take no for an answer. We're going to find a way to go forward no matter what. And then the second one was, um, was be the ancestor you want to have. So the idea is what kind of ancestor do you want to be? How do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be somebody who, you know, builds people up and values people and builds confidence? And we talk about it in terms of political ancestors, you know, and we think about who are our current political ancestors. You know, we can think of Claudia Jones or, you know, uh, people may have inspired us, Mother Jones, you know, all, all these, you know, amazing folks that have come through the movement before us. Um, but um, so there's that was the second piece. What kind of ancestor do you want to be? And so you're mindful about that. And then the third piece was make your movement irresistible. <laughs> and I just love that so much because like meetings don't have to be dour and sour and awful and hard It's a hard meeting i feel like i just got you know beaten about the you know the head and ears like people work hard every day they they don't need to come into a space where they're shamed or made to feel small or where we're not allowed to grapple together to come up with the best solutions because the truth is none of us have the all, all have all the answers like we can only solve things collectively and i feel like it's such a hokey thing to say and your viewers are just probably going to think i'm just full of hokiness or corniness or whatever but the movement literally solves all problems big and small and i'll give you one silly little example but we uh, typically before covid would do a big outreach on labor day in toronto and we would uh, like have freezies to hand out because we want to be fun it's not just here's some more political literature for you but here have a freezy and let's talk decent work kind of thing but as the station got more popular every year, first you know, first we had 500 freezies, and then we had a thousand freezies, and then the next you know we had to have several thousand freezies to be able to hand out on the march. And then the question becomes, how on earth, like if you get them cheap and, and you need to keep them frozen, <laughs> how on people, earth are you going to freeze? Yeah, how are you on earth are you going to freeze 7,000 freezies to deliver? It's like we start running out of people's freezers in their apartment buildings, you know? So. <laughs> So I did. So I didn't. I wasn't sure what we were going to do. So I just asked the question of the meeting, and then it turns out that uh, one of our stalwart organizers happened to work at a dry ice place, and they knew exactly they how you could freeze seven thousand freezies. And it turned out that dry ice place, dry ice place, was just like a block and a half away from where we were going to be stationed at the at the parade. And so anyway, it was just amazing, you know. Or even things like translation, like how are we going to get translation done? And then, but if you can pose the question back to the moment people rise up and, and solve those problems so 
it really is. And that's why it does really matter to find out what worked, it. what didn't work and all that stuff. I learned so much from being in this space as well, that even something that people are so beaten down in some ways, I don't want to say people are beaten down, but like all of us lack confidence. All of us feel yeah. like there's someone smarter than us, that, that somebody knows more than us, that we're not going to do it properly. And so you get all that stuff. And so to have conversations with people you've never had, never had before to maybe interrupt people, you know, on the street corner, it's like, it's a hard thing to do, but we learned that it's like, wow, like if you have if you kind of have a little bit of a theme. I remember we did a Thanksgiving outreach where people dressed up um, with, you know, aprons and chef's hat and we handed out little pieces of pumpkin pie and we set a, we had a big table that uh, set for Thanksgiving, but the plates were empty because not enough food and so forth. And we made the connection with migrant farm workers and all of that. But what was extraordinary for me is that when you gave people you know, a bit of a costume, a lanyard, you know, a, a, some props. It's how people kind of come out of themselves because it's like, oh, you know, I I have legitimacy for being here, you know. And so for me, I'm just starting to understand that creative element isn't isn't just fluff. It's actually how you can people can build up their chops to feel like we have the right to inter interrupt somebody on the street and have great conversations and feel like and eat pumpkin pie, you know, like that. Well, how nice is that? You reminded me of something I had forgotten. And it's like, I've just got this huge smile on my face. Uh, we were organizing around shopping centers. Galen Weston was our target before it was cool, right? Before it was cool to hate on <laughs> yes. Galen Weston. Uh, there was this mini campaign and we got his, you know, for the Fight 15 and Fairness campaign, and we got cupcakes, you know, the kind of cupcakes that are in a slab. It's all together. It's a cake. And, and Galen Weston's image was on there with the let, let them eat cake kind of messaging and got two of those and set up tables and the amount of people that came. Uh, I had so much fun. And yes, not only did everyone there have so much fun, the group photo, you can just see it. Uh, everyone that walked by, it, they maybe didn't want a cupcake, but they stopped to talk. Uh, and I just had the most fun as an organizer, honestly, even going to get the cake and giggling and giving it to the lady at um, No Frills, you know, can you print your boss? They wouldn't do it at No Frills, by the way. I had to go to Sobeys. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a conflict of interest there, but I'm just remembering how much fun that was. It never felt like work ever. And you talked about the skills that exist, you know, they solve everything, the skills that exist within the movement. Just the other day we were talking about, you know, France was in it doing its thing, right? We have general strikes and protests and, you know, uh, Mason workers get out there, they're building a wall with mortar uh, levels, uh, blocking the street with um, a very functional wall. And I say that a lot, especially in critique of the more partisan movements that don't enable the grassroots with that trust because the skill sets for <laughs> dry ice, everything, databases, creating websites, you name it, it's there. And if they are excited enough and feel welcome enough, yeah, you can tap into a lot of, fr you know, free or cheap labor, because let's be realistic, we do have to get by on people's goodwill most of the time to really build these movements. It's great to pay a core group to get it done, but yeah, it's got to be fun. And I'm glad you hit on that because we tried to keep reminding that to ourselves and to our audience that that joy belongs in these movements, even though they are really hard fights. You know, they're serious topics. You hear really heavy stories. Um, you're fighting for survival for folks. And it's hard to lose, or it, rather, it's easy to lose sight of that need to make it yeah. really appealing if you're going to be spending that free time somewhere, right? Like, it's got to lift you up. Um, yeah. And I feel you guys really do a good job of that. Like, I would love to point a lot of people your way because... Yeah, my experience there again. It was just absolutely incredible. Yeah. Well, and and we obviously loved working with you and and everyone brings their ideas as well. Like I think that's the other thing too is like we should make stickers or we could, you know, how and how are we going to do it? And I think 
I mean, in some ways, I really, of course, we want we we're all fighting for good jobs and so and so forth. But the truth is, you know, if we're going to basically build a movement, you know, of the immense majority of people, or it's going to take, you know, everyone playing their a leadership role, and it's not going to be on their work time because usually uh, there's not much demo there's no democracy in a workplace. You know, if we were to tell the truth about things, you know, when you go to work generally for most working class people, you check democracy at the door and you're lucky, you know, and so basically what we want is a movement of leaders of the immense majority of people that are all participating and, you know, it's it's not going to be a paid endeavor, but it's a collective payback because we all win and we all benefit. And when we succeed, even, you know, even just through the experience with the minimum wage, like to win, uh, you know, 14 and then $15, but then to lose the 15, but then to get it back and then to get rid of the sub minimum wage rates for liquor servers, like it like that's an interesting experience to go through with a movement you know as well because it's like it's not just because you win doesn't mean that's it you know okay so that's it we won because we had that experience of bill 148 of winning it and then i think it was bill 47 that undid it yeah. and like and i i wouldn't mind talking about some of the amazing things that we won in in the original leg legislation because because I think sometimes people feel like it's not possible to win things, but we did win it. If we won it, then we can win it again. And something you mentioned, like equal pay for part-time, full-time and contract workers, that had implications for college and university faculty. That has implica had implications for temp agency workers. Um, there were situations where we heard um, of, a, of a unionized warehouse whereby there, was a, the, there would be the unionized workers, but then the employer would make use of an army of temp agency workers to you know, be flexible during supply and demand. But as soon as that, that law was passed, um, that said, if you hire a, a temp agency worker and you have directly hired workers, those temp workers have to be paid the same as your directly hired workers, which means any profit for the temp agency would have to come on top of wages instead who's of, gonna do out that? of wages. Yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden, the, the employers are like, it makes no sense for us to go through a temp agency. We're going to hire all these workers directly, which went some job security for them. But another amazing thing is that they all then became union members because they would, you know, so instead of yeah. ha hiring this, you know, massive influx of temp agency workers, then suddenly they were hired and then they became union members. So it was just they were no longer divided problem. either, right? Like, those, well, and because they, the workplace was already unionized uh, under the, because when, when workers are brought in through a temp agency worker, the, the agency is technically the employer. So technically they're not part of the union, yep. but as soon as you're in the scope, then you're covered. And so like, this was an, uns, you know, part of the legislation that not too many people spoke about, but it was a huge and probably an unanticipated, un unanticipated positive consequence even from our perspective because we were just trying to like get some basic dignity and you know job decency for those folks but when you see it in motion now all of a sudden it's like boom 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 all these positive ripple effects come from that so anyway so i, I can't remember why i got onto that but there you have it <laughs> well you wanted to talk about some of the victories that had been there mm -hmm. um i remember there were changes around shift work a yes. lot of folks have almost no protection around really precarious shift work, getting canceled, having three or four employers and having to balance, not knowing when your shift was going to start. There were real implications there. And like, who, those are kind of one of those issues I was talking about that like, don't get a lot of pickup in the news, you know, um, but from hearing people's stories and when we talked about that as a group, it that was going to make a big difference uh, for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's absolutely true. And there were like, and part of it was because it was the changing workplaces review. And so there was just such, it was such a big comprehensive. And this was under the liberals? This was under, this was the, previous... under the, the Yeah, it was under the liberals. And, 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 you know, in some fairness, there's, you know, that uh, Kathleen Wynne was, Kathleen Wynne was premier. And I think she became leader of the party at a time when I think Dalton McGinty was about to, be given the heave ho she came in and i think gave the liberals one more you know like was able to get a, a another government out of it but i think it was a minority government and then i think the hope was that this legislation was so popular and indeed it was that that would have been sufficient to help secure the next election but it just wasn't 
quite enough to undo, you know, but, but I, I sometimes people conclude that this piece of legislation, you know, was not popular or something like that, but it was absolutely popular. And if there was any, you know, tactical mistake the government made in implementing, it was to actually go, go, to, they went too slowly because they, there was a lot of accommodations made, you know, employers didn't participate in the first round of consultations. And then instead of saying snooze, you lose, uh, they, they extended the process. And there was even a, a an additional round of committee hearings around the legislation itself. So it all had the effect of prolonging it. So by the time the minimum wage came into effect, it was literally happened in January and the election was in June and people hadn't quite got a taste. And they even the equal pay piece was not didn't get didn't come in until April 1st. So with an election in June, it just was not enough time for people to really absorb what was at stake in this election. And had it been done, implemented sooner and more quickly, people would have had a lot more ownership of it and it would have been much harder for a government to roll it back. And so I think for any political entity that's looking to affect change, you know, to be bold and have confidence and do as much as you can as well, because no, like the get it early on in that mandate <laughs> and early in the mandate. Cause I will also say like, I've never experienced like, you know, I've, I mean, I've campaigned a lot on different issues and some issues are more popular and less popular and all of that. But there was a real moment. Like, I remember when the uh, we were invited to come to the news conference that was going to be announcing Bill 148 and all of these changes. And I remember being really excited and I remember walking through my, the local, my local Dufferin Mall and I was think, looking at all the people working so hard for so little money and I was thinking to myself, you're going to get a raise, and you're going to get a raise, and you're going to get a raise. And it's one of those things. <laughs> you're all yeah, get like it just my throat. I was just like teary eyed. That was the night before. The next day they announced the legislation. And, and I swear to you, by the time we got back to the office, it felt like there was a tsunami of reaction where the corporations lost their mind. And I really think it was a situation where corporations just never took our movement for decent work seriously, didn't think a government would ever pay attention to it. And when those corporations woke up and started shaking their tails, it was it was like a tsunami of reaction. So the next thing you knew, it was like, you know, Everything was going to fall apart. The Chamber of <laughs> Commerce published this so-called economic the sky is report falling. that, yeah, and but it was literally this Cancia was the uh, outfit that published this, saying there was going to be almost two hundred thousand jobs were going to be lost as a direct result of raising the minimum wage in this province, and of course workers yeah. care about things like that makes people very nervous because the only thing worse than a bad sure. job is no job at all. And if suddenly every employer is saying you're going to be worse off because of this, like it scares workers and it scared me. Like it was one of those things where it's like, like, how do we take this on? So we did everything we could to do the edge like really ramp up the educationals. Um, you know, where does profit come from? Like do raising wages actually cause inflation? Is it true that Cineplex Odeon raised its movie theater prices because of the minimum wage increase? Like we had to take all these things on and it wasn't easy. And I thought, are we even going to hold it together? Because, you know, it's a, it, it was just ferocious. I feel like that was like a fight, uh, the the likes of which I I I feel like I've never encountered before or since about just trying to hang on to what we had. Um, but one thing for me that was really interesting is that one of the things we were trying to do, it was so we had the backlash, um, we had some of those changes come into into effect by January, and then we had the election in June, and of course you know Doug Ford got elected, and then of course the first thing, the very first thing Doug Ford did was go after all of those things, and so again trying to beat back the worst elements of that. We did manage to hang on to, you know, quite a few things, not, you know, not enough, obviously. But when we were going into, I remember doing a new market, uh, a farmer's market, and we were went in, um, in this moment, it was a, it was a slight, uh, it was basically the same petition that we had been using up until that <laughs> point, where it's like, we're inviting you to sign a petition to, that is essentially asking the government to do nothing. 
is not an unusual thing. And here we're asking, sign a petition, ask the government to do nothing. Why? Because what's happening? The corporations are trying to make Doug Ford roll back our decent work laws. And do you want paid sick days? Do you want the $15 minimum wage? Do you want these things? It's like, yes, yes, yes. Well, it's like, well, then sign this petition to say, stand to ask the government to stand up to the corporations. And it was very interesting because even in writings where the majority of people voted for Doug Ford, they all wanted equal pay. They all wanted their paid sick days. They all wanted decent wages. And they all said, Doug Ford is never going to let that happen. He's for the little guy. You're mistaken. And when Bill 47 was tabled and when it was passed and when all those changes went through and we went back into those writings, people were absolutely devastated and shocked and for me and many actually joined you know uh, joined the, the the movement for decent work I, I remember being on a brock campus where you know a young guy was really sheepish he said i i voted for doug ford i was like excellent you should phone you should phone him right now and tell him to not, not roll anything back it's like and was so surprised to be welcomed into the movement despite the fact that he might have not voted the way i would have voted but but, and I think that's the thing is a lot of people, and I think this relates also to an analysis of the most recent election, but I think a lot of people believe the rhetoric that Doug Ford was giving, that he was for the little guy, that he was gonna be for jobs, 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 nurses, 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 the end of hallway medicine, you remember all that? You know, of nice. course it's the opposite. Yeah, it's the opposite. Um, but what? that had a, a different result for this last election. Yeah, jump in, sorry. Sorry, no, because I, I wasn't going to ask about this. I hadn't thought about it, but you you did. You're talking about going issue based, right? So I was there at that new market, farmer's market, and I had gone into those environments as well as a candidate or, you know, flying the orange flag. And I'll tell you, it is so much easier to talk to people without that partisan branding and just talk about what matters to them you know, like their pay, because, you know, you say a lot of people bought into the rhetoric. A lot of people don't even have time to listen to it. And they are voting for who their dad voted for. They're voting for who their neighbor's sign has up. And a lot of, sometimes a lot of thought does not even go into voting. It is an emotional reaction that dictates a lot of votes because in my writing, you know, you could run a dead fish as a conservative. In fact, they did and have. And they will win. Um, but I had no problem. I, again, it was like your experience with the status for all. I really don't remember very many objections in my local farmer's market either, which is even deeper into conservative territory. And yeah, there were no arguments there. That was an easy sell, especially the way that you post it. But I found the less you actually spoke of Doug Ford and the more you spoke of corporations playing influence over it, the more receptive they were. Because some, even though they knew what Doug was doing was wrong, there's this emotional thing that happens, this cognitive dissonance that they won't allow themselves to draw those connections. But everyone knows that corporations suck, right? Like everyone plays that shtick, even the the right, you know, they've worked that into anti-elitism. We, we kind of inherently know that. And that was just the part of organizing, like that type of organizing that just really made it easy to create a working class consciousness around popular issues, issues that would play into everyone's life like immediately, right? Like those yeah. raises and those changes would have from that day forth. I imagine people were already spending that increase in minimum wage in their minds, right? Workers had been guaranteed it for, you know, January 1st and it, then it was cut off like abruptly. And yeah, like that, that kind of organizing is actually so much easier. And I see now though, that out of necessity, or, or maybe you can talk to it, it's a much bigger group going at the, the June 3rd. I kind of want to transition into the all out on June 3rd that I know that uh, your group has been building up towards. This is mostly the creature of the Ontario, Federa Ontario Federation of Labor, to my understanding. But clearly the NDP has also um, gotten into supporting this, supporting the demands um, for the most part that you folks are making. First, maybe let's talk about June 3rd, because this might be news to my audience going, what are you talking about? What is happening? Uh, 
tell us like what your role is there and then maybe we can get into how that alliance is working together if it's an alliance just how that work kind of grows together to get all these moving parts to to go towards something quite large i mean yeah. i'm hoping i mean that's how it's feeling yes <laughs> yes well that's a, that's great feedback actually well interestingly enough in, in some ways to me to my mind june 3rd is a bit connected to the results of the last election and and i wanted to touch a little bit on you know the the experience we had going into the 2018 election versus the experience we had going into the 2022 election and then and just because in 2018 our own base of supporters were confused around you know who was going to be the champion of the little guy and even people who had been out tabling with us and collecting signatures on petitions thought Doug Ford was going to be their candidate and it was just in that 30 day election period it was just not enough time to help unpack all of that stuff. So even before the, the polls were done, we knew the writing was on the wall because it, there was just so much confusion around it. So I thought heading into 2022, well, the good thing about 2022 is there's gonna be no doubt, there's gonna be no confusion about Doug Ford. And so this is a chance to actually elect decent work champions. And our approach about who's a decent work champion is that we ask which candidates endorse the demands that workers have brought forward to address the crisis of precari precarious employment and any candidate who does endorse our demands, we just we, we just let people know these are the candidates. So the closer we got to the election and the more that we were leading on vote, <laughs> vote for your for a decent work candidate in your riding. It's funny. We took. It's funny. I had put these two things together, but you know, you, you're mentally prepared for a status for all, and then it's like pushing an open door. I thought the door was going to be wide open to electing decent work candidates in 2022, but the anger was like I have never experienced so much anger from people in every, especially in in really working class communities where people are just like, don't even talk to me about elections these elections are bullshit. These elections are racist. These elections are rigged. I want nothing to, and I was like, would you like to even just read a piece, of, read something, you know, read it, read a little thing about it. It was just like nothing. And it was so consistent, especially in working class neighborhoods and outside of no frills. And again, 30 days is just not enough time to unpack, you know, what is the role of elections and why do they feel rigged? And the truth is that actually, you know, elections don't change lives very much for or for working class people in precarious employment. If you're poor, if you have a low wage job, if you're just struggling to make ends meet, life isn't all that different depending on, you know, regardless who gets elected. And so for a lot of people, I mean, it's fair for people to say, like, why should I even care about an election? And that's a legitimate conversation to have. You're not going to solve it in 30 days. But what I really noticed is that the anger was legitimate and it was good, righteous anger. But the way it was being expressed is to say, we're not going to vote at all. But interestingly, enough, so then that gets parlayed out on the mainstream news and by, you know, even progressives as people are lazy, people are apathetic. They don't if care. you can't be bothered, bothered to vote, then you get the government that you deserve, which is which is not really, I think, the, the best interpretation of it. People don't vote because they're discouraged, disenfranchised. And also in this case, I think there was just so much anger and an, and, and an active, you know, boycott, if you will, not clearly articulated that way, but that's where their anger was expressed is like, fuck the election, pardon my language. But what's bizarre about that moment, the lowest voter turnout in the history of Ontario, and yet six months later, led by education workers across this province, we basically are on the precipice of an indefinite general strike in response to legislation that Doug Ford delivered. And in fact, the, the defeat of Bill 28 was the was the, the frankly the most decisive blow to Doug Ford's agenda and that was just six months later so that tells us that there's a lot of anger and if there is going to be a legitimate receptacle a legitimate or an, a, a perceived legitimate and per, a practical and useful place to put that anger people are going to step up for it and our organizers like nadira who organize in you know st jamestown where for ordinary working class people 
having education workers out of school and the law, like, what are you going to do with your kids when you're in a low, you know, you can't work from home like so many people. So they, in order to help those education workers fight as long as they need to, they started organizing child care supports in their own buildings because it's like, okay, well, if they're going to do that, and I know what it's like, they're the most vulnerable workers in the education sector. We're going to, like, how can we make this work? Okay, how are we going to organize child care? How are we going to address this? And and actually, some members of WAC are also members, you know, are the lunchroom supervisors that have two hours or 90 minutes of decent pay for that lunchroom shift Monday to Friday, and they organize their whole work life around those 90 minutes of half decent pay in order to try to make ends meet and so those are workers that were also scared and having to think through what it's going to mean to go on strike and so forth and yet they did it two years of organizing didn't come out of nowhere but they were then ready that what you know they were ready to defy legislation if they were given back to work legislation but i don't think anybody ever thought ford would overplay his hand so much by tabling preemptive like criminalizing the right to strike and to talk about strikes and to basically criminalize the the, the fight for decent work and that's where justice for workers kind of came in because we're like First of all, this is a massive turnout. It's a massive strike vote. And if 55,000 education workers can't win their demands, then we're going to be in really big trouble. So we need to make sure that we support those workers and do everything we can. And that's why we launched Paint the Province Purple. And that helped give an outlet for all the invisible solidarity across the province. We sent posters to 70 different communities across the province. It's like, my geography sucks, but it's like Alfred, Ontario to Petrolia, Ontario, and like everywhere in between, top to bottom, east to west, north to south. Like it's incredible how many people wanted to paint the province purple with their posters because they wanted to support those workers. And so when you think about Bill 28, it was tabled on a Monday, it got royal assent on a Thursday, on Saturday, the, the, by this time we'd had, you know, three and a half weeks of paint the province purple and solidarity. The OFL calls an emergency action on Tuesday after work. Thousands of people come down on like a moment's notice. Wednesday, we have a mass phone zap where we've, for the first time, we have over 2,000 people registered for the phone zap. Thursday, the parents organize a rally outside the Sheridan Center where bargaining is taking place. And that's the same day that the legislation that criminalizes the right to strike gets royal assent. And on Friday, tens of thousands of the most vulnerable education workers walk out anyway, defying the legislation. And I don't know if your listeners know this, but hundreds of OPSU members who were not in a legal strike position wildcatted along with them in Barry alone. Uh, one OPSU local brought six over 600 people to the picket lines and walked the picket lines all day long with QP members on the 4th of November. Um, and so what's extraordinary about that is that Saturday, the uh, Ontario Federation of Labour meets, they pass a motion for an indefinite general strike. And on Monday, before they get a chance to announce it, Doug Ford butts in line, does the news conference and says Bill 28 is dead. And not only is it dead going forward, it's dead retroactively, which means for all those folks that say you can't change history, well, actually, that Friday strike went from an illegal strike to a legal strike because, of course, the, they had the legal right to strike, and it was only Bill 28 that made it an illegal strike. So they did change, uh, they did change history by getting Bill 28 repealed. So, and the reason why I'm going through all of that is that that's the context I think for the Enough Is Enough campaign, because if that kind, if if there if there's a possibility that we can begin to replicate the kind of grassroots organizing that went into creating the conditions to for education workers to to lead and defy this legislation and to inspire that kind of solidarity i think for me that's what i see the the enough is enough campaign is that it's 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 an opportunity to connect our struggles because as you know our lane is the you know employment standards and decent work lane but this campaign attempts to bridge all the issues together. And I think the intent is for June 3rd is for us to really, you know, we're all coming out of COVID, we're all rebuilding our, you know, our capacity and so forth, but can we uh, build enough capacity to show that on June 3rd that actually we're the majority in Ontario, not Doug Ford with his 18% of the eligible vote in mandate and reassert ourselves that we're the majority and we're not gonna go down without a fight on this. 
and to not rule out the possibility of strike action as a legitimate tactic. But how do we make sure that a general strike is going to be not something that's like a red button that gets pushed from the top by leaders, but how is it that we make it a profoundly democratic aspect that we build workers' confidence to say, you know what, I'm ready for this. And how do we make sure that it's a mass movement from below and not something that's just called from above? And I think for me, that's what's so exciting about it. Uh, you know, we'll see where it lands. I always say dream big and then see where we land. But to my mind, June 3rd is that opportunity. And to really, because just as you say about labor, working conditions, workers are also, you know, facing a rent crisis, an affordability crisis, a crisis in healthcare, or public services, the whole bent gamut. And what's beautiful about this campaign, I think, is that it tries to link all these things. And so instead of us fighting in our little silos, imagine if we could all come together on a day and do what we can to show we're the majority, not Ford. Because if you can imagine that solidarity that you talked about, sorry, the solidarity that you talked about surrounding those 55,000 workers was a very niche subject. Although collective bargaining rights, you know, are profound and have ripple effects. But a lot of people really don't understand that. It wouldn't impact their tomorrow. Definitely not. But they still came out. The same apathetic people that didn't vote, perhaps, right? Like that. Sorry, there were scare quotes there for the audio version. <laughs> so we know they're not apathetic. And they seem to start to be understanding these avenues of disruption are perhaps more effective than going to the ballot box in the end. Um, although, you know, the argument is made, you can do both. <laughs> um, but yeah, though... It, you definitely tapped into something there because people definitely, even though they couldn't connect to education workers, were out there organizing their own small local events. Mm -hmm. There wasn't the backlash we normally see against teacher strikes that come with the inconvenience of having your kids out of school and, and, and struggling to, to figure out what to do there, right? Like a lot of strikes don't mm -hmm. impact the general public in the way a teacher strike does. Um, Hopefully we see similar, I, I do see a lot of solidarity around the PSAC strike that's happening right now with 115,000. So if they can't win their demands, I mean, with this kind of solidarity, I see a lot of groups stepping up and, and taking some of their energy right now to make sure that those solidarity networks are there to help them be successful. This is a lot of work, Pam. You do a lot. And you've, you've even in this interview, we've talked from like almost the beginning of Kathleen Wynne's term to what you're going to be up to June 3rd. I I'm assuming you would do work in some sort of vacation time, I hope. But we just started a mini series called Burnout. So I'm guessing you can know where this question is going. As an individual and as a movement, like you aren't actually water, though. I know you want to channel water, but water doesn't need to <laughs> replenish its energy, okay? It doesn't need to eat, um, you know, it can get away with being so relentless. How do you stay relentless without burning out? Maybe you do burn out. And then how do you make sure that the movements you're creating, the groups you're creating, the work that you're demanding, you don't demand it, but you know what I mean, isn't depleting your most valuable resource, you know, people. So how do, how do you stay well, away from and that? That's, I think that's... Sorry. Yes, and that's, that is an excellent, excellent question. And the one thing I'll, like, maybe I'll even confess a little bit is that there's something that's actually intoxicating and energizing about effective work. And it's like, and seeing other people bloom and seeing other people find their voice or find their niche or just find their spot. It's like there, it really is like, for me, it's probably a little bit addictive as well. Like, and it's, a and drug. it's like, I, I, it's, it's yeah. Like, so, so I will just, you know, that, that is a definite motivator. Um, but also like, I think um, the, the bigger your movement, um, the more space there is for a division of labor. And a friend of mine, I used to talk about the importance of having a division of labor. And my friend um, did a variation on that expression, which is uh, we need, we always need to be multiplying the division of labor. And, and you know, our- That's complicated little, math, you know, we're, we're <laughs> But we're like a little, like I often say to people, 
uh, and using the water analogy, uh, uh, water boils when molecules vibrate. And not all the molecules start to vibrate at the same time, but some start to vibrate and the others start to vibrate and others starts to vibrate. And then before you know it, water is boiling and maybe it'll like boil right, you know, and overflow the pot. But that's the whole thing is like small numbers. And, and there's just a lot of interesting things. I think, you know, we get inspired by history and big upheavals in history, but our circumstances are a little bit different. You know, workplaces are much more spread out now. The, the, the standard employment is not as common. So it's hard to get a certain number of people at, uh, you know, all assembled at the same time and the same day and all of that kind of stuff. But if we be, if we're thinking about little parts, little committees, little networks, little things here and there, if we can, you know, create enough of those, those are all little cogs that turn bigger cogs. And everyone's heard that analogy before. But the, but the beautiful thing is, is that if you have, you know, I often say to people, it's like a stool needs three legs to stand up. And so if you have three people, then you've got, you know, critical mass. But if you get a fourth in the mix, then that allows somebody to take a break or take a vacation and the stool won't tip over. So if you could kind of get your three legs, you're good, you're standing. And then if you can get your fourth, if you can get your fifth, a sixth or seventh, then you're not dependent on all the legs of the chair at any given moment. And then that does allow people to kind of take a break or deal with a family thing or, you know, whatever it is that are, is going on with people's lives. And then the other thing too, is just life changes. I will say COVID is, it was challenging because it's not just that we were in lockdown, that people really did lose their jobs. People really, people really did die. People really did lose family members. People really did have to move and follow work and deal with all those things. So we are in this position of rebuilding. Um, and I think it's it's an exciting moment on that front. But I also think it's like we don't have to be discouraged or we're feeling small. We just have to, you know, be be having those conversations and not being content for symbolic things. Like I feel like, I don't know if I'm getting older, but I feel like I, I don't I just it, I just don't want to do things for the sake of doing things. I want to have <laughs> I would much rather have a longer organizing conversation with somebody than go out and hand out a thousand leaflets, but not have a single good conversation, you know. So it, it's like it's like how do we work effectively? How, how do we assess our work? How do we have realistic expectations? I think sometimes we. We might have unrealistic things like we want 100,000 people out, but, you know, we just got out of a hospital bed. So maybe, you know, that's not going to be possible. So trying to always have an honest assessment of where we're at, having a realistic expectation of what's possible. And I think when we do that and we don't have to say movement building is fun or, you know, hype it up in a way that's not really accurate. But my experience has been if everybody shares a common roadmap and we all know what the terrain is like, and we all know it's a pretty steep hill that we have to climb. If we have, if we all have a little bit of a knapsack, some provisions in the knapsack, some hiking boots, we say to each other, it's like, can we climb this hill? We got this. And then we can do it, you know? And even when we, when Bill 47 went through and we had our decent work laws rolled back, uh, we, you know, we gave it our la uh, the best fight we could. We shut down the legislature. We delayed the, the vote for a day, which I thought was pretty great. And then we all came over to the Workers Action Center. We had a big mass meeting there. We piled everybody in. We broadcast it live on Facebook. And Dina asked the question. It's like, here we are. We did, we Bill 47 did just go through, but I want to ask every single one of you, do you feel stronger today or weaker today than we were last year and the year before? And to a person, people said, we are stronger. And it was a very simple explanation for why we lost Bill 47 is that we are, were not big enough. We were not big enough. We needed a much bigger army to build that, that network of persuaders and organizers and hard conversation havers and all of those kinds of things. And so it's pretty clear. So it's, there's no mystery to it. We weren't big enough. We have to, we have to keep at it, but we kind of know where we're going. We also know what's possible, even though we're small, like we did get a lot done and those wage increases really mattered. And the fact that Doug Ford felt he had to restore the $15 minimum wage before heading back to the polls tells us how popular this movement really is. You know, it makes me feel like, yes, it is not easy work It's and it's not short-term work, 
But if we're clear on those sorts of things and we use not just winning things, but are we building each other up? Are we finding spaces for new people? Are we feeling joy in what we're doing? You know, those are the other measurements that I think help us have a have a more honest assessment of where we're going and we don't win everything. But do we feel stronger? Do we feel bigger? Do we feel more confident? You know, and if the answer to that is yes, then I think we're on the right path. So I don't know if TMI or too rambly, but that's kind of that's kind of how we do it. No, that was absolutely perfect, Pam. Thank you so much for taking time to, you know, give us a little bit of an inside look. Thank you so much for taking me under your wing. I I know I've thanked you before, but honestly, um, that was the time where you talked about, you know, people not having faith in themselves. Like I pure imposter syndrome over here, right? Continued. And the trust and empowerment and just faith you had in every volunteer that stepped forward. Because, you know, I try to tell people that too, you know, if someone comes to do the work, give them work, trust them that they have the skills or they will get the skills or that, you know, that they'll do it just as well as you can, um, because you need so many hands. So, Thank you again for for teaching all of us, continuing this work, and Dina and all the other great people over there, and um, again, taking the time for Blueprints. Well, honestly, thank you. And I really want to just say learning is a two-way street all the time, and I was just telling sharing with uh, with somebody who's uh, doing some work with us from TMU to say even it doesn't matter how long you've been organizing you still get those water slide moments where you learn new things and you're inspired by new things and Bill 28 that the fight of the education workers and I do want to say the two years that they organized to get that strike vote uh, and how well positioned and how many conversations were had like for me that was such an inspiring thing and learning the importance of finding something easy, visible, and everywhere for people to show their solidarity because solidarity is in everyone's hearts. There's just often no outlet for it. They're waiting for someone else to do it. And if we can just make, you know, we some of us have been saying Eve, uh, or um, easy, visible, everywhere. Make solidarity I wrote it down. on the Eve. Yes, it's, it's amazing. So it's like, just think about the Eve, make sure everybody has a pl- part to play and they do generally rise to the occasion. And if they don't, then let's find out what happened because sometimes there's a bit, there's a barrier or log jam that we can fix it and move on and get them involved as well. So I, I do want to just say it's a two way street, mm-hmm. learning, learning, learning all the time, including from you. And I also remember you being part of the little picket we did at a chamber of commerce yes. with Christine Elliott. And I remember being inside myself quite nervous about that event. But uh, the amazing thing about that was how many people coming through didn't weren't yelling at us, were taking our leaflets. And I that blew me away because I it's again, I was like, small businesses, Christine Elliott, gonna, everyone's gonna be mad and hostile. But the exact opposite. So again, so thank you for facilitating that process. And I'm so glad we did that because that was a really important moment for me too. It's like we, you know, the the mainstream media and everything about the system we live under makes us not want to have faith in each other. But if we can trust that most of the time the people will be the best they can be, then, you know, then we're on good feet. So anyway, and you helped me learn that moment um, for all the work that you did at that time. So thank you for that. Thank you, Pam.